Yes, thank you for having me. I don't know how exciting I can make tax and financial issues at 8.30 in the morning, but I am going to try my best. Uh, just to give you a little background about myself and why I'm here today, I am an attorney. I'm licensed in four states, Illinois, Missouri, Florida, and Arizona. I also have a master's of business administration. I am also a managing real estate broker. We have an active real estate brokerage and investment corporation in Illinois and Florida that I actively manage. We have about 500 properties. I'm also a licensed title insurance agent. I do write title insurance policies for real estate transactions in Illinois. Our practice, our law and accounting practice in Illinois, if my father didn't share it with you or not, is mainly mergers and acquisitions of privately held companies throughout the United States. About 50 to 75% of our practice is M&A work. So because of that, and because we are a combination of attorneys, my father's also a CPA, we have other CPAs in our office, uh, we get involved in a lot of the tax and financial issues that go along with those um, transactions. We deal in all different types of industries. I've helped transfer equipment companies. I've helped transfer brokerage companies, insurance brokerage companies, real estate brokerage companies. We've gone so far as to transfer odd companies like pet cemeteries. That has to be one of the oddest businesses I've ever helped transfer. But you know what? It's all a financial statement. It's all a balance sheet, an income statement, and a cash flow statement. So to us, it's the same. To the business owner, it is not. But to us professionals, we're basically looking at the same information. My father was scheduled to speak today, and we do apologize that he's not here. I know he thoroughly enjoyed his speech to you all last time. And we appreciate the flexibility that FFR has provided to us and uh, I, I'm glad for the opportunity. Uh, I have spoke with my father for, I've worked with him for 17 years and spoke side by side with him for a lot of those years. So I hope I can convey some of his enthusiasm, some of his ideas, my thoughts, and my perspective. I know he has large shoes to fill. I cannot fill them. I can only step into them for a temporary amount of time. Does anyone know what that is? It's a pillow. It's a heart pillow. That's the pillow that they give to quadruple bypass patient, patients or any type of patient. He did suffer a heart attack. It was a massive heart attack. He ended up having a quadruple bypass surgery. And I know it's odd to see a heart when we're talking about taxes, but part of our speech today and part of our lecture is about succession planning and about financial planning. And my father and I both feel that we are a living, breathing example of the succession planning and the tax planning that all of you can provide to your clients. So some of the topics that we're gonna to discuss today, I've already, someone's already mentioned it, are the Kennedy tax rates 50 years ago. I'm gonna show you those tax rates. We think it's bad right now. Let's take a look at what the tax rates were back when Kennedy was president. The new tax rates for 2014, the expired tax incentives that have ended in 12, 1231.13 that have not been renewed. We'll talk briefly about your section 105 and 125 plans, which I'm sure most of you are very knowledgeable about. Portability of the estate tax exemption and how to get your clients to keep it, not lose it, and how the states are impacted. Because each state is different when it comes to its estate tax exemption and its effect on portability. So all of you coming from different states working with clients in different states are going to have to understand how those different exemption amounts and the different portability rules are being applied. Problems that we have with audited financial statements. As attorneys that specialize in mergers and acquisitions, we don't like audited financial statements, and I'll explain why. Community property problems. Of course, out west, here in California, you're a community property state. And the problems that go along with that in a legal setting. Buy-sell agreements and insurance, I'm sure you all deal with those on a daily basis, and if you don't, you need to come see me, but I'm sure that you do. And I'll talk a little bit about the structure, the triggering events, the valuation methods that we put into those, and things of that nature. Trusts and the follow-up requirements. 
Trusts are still a good vehicle. They're a traditional vehicle. They're strong. We still like them today. Limited liability companies. I speak a lot about limited liability companies. Our real estate investment firm is a limited liability company. It is a series limited liability company. I'm going to explain that term to you. If you have not heard of that before, that is something you are going to want to share with your clients. And we'll have a short period of questions and answers. My job is threefold. It's to inform you. I want you to go out of here knowing what the new tax rates are, what the implications are to the topics that we're talking about. I want to educate you. I hope that you learn one or two small things. My style is different than my father's. I can promise you this, I will get through my slides. And I know he cannot. And I will get through mine. My last goal is to motivate you. I, how do I motivate? I was thinking about this last week. My wife and I were out. My wife is here with me today. We've been married 17 years. I'm very, very proud of that. And she's out with me about a week ago, and we said, how in the world am I going to motivate 200 people at 8 o'clock in the morning about taxes and financial matters? And she goes, well, no one wants to pay them. I said, well, that's perfect. I'm going to show you some ways that we reduce taxes in deals and how we save taxes to our clients and hopefully motivate you a little bit to have these discussions with your people. Can anybody tell me how long is the Internal Revenue Code today? Can I have a guess? How in pages? How many pages do you think the Internal Revenue Code is right now? <laughs> Somebody's looked at the next slide. <laughs> 86,000 pages long. Today's tax code is 86,000 pages long. In 1913, that number was only 400. In 1984, 26,300. A 26,000 dollar increase in 71 years. And now look where we went in the last 30. We jumped at 60,000 pages. Folks, thank you. I will always have a job. I really appreciate that. It is nearly four million words long. It reflects decades of change, and it'll continue to expand and continue its complexity. I'll share with you just a few of my father's anecdotes that he likes to give during his speech. I have my own, I have my own case studies. One of the things he always told me, he goes, Roman, he goes, never talk politics with your clients. We're tax attorneys. We want someone different in the White House every time because they change the tax code every time they're in the White House. And it's very true. Holds true to this day. One thing that's not on this slide, and I thought about this last night when I was looking over, it's 86,000 pages long and we think it's long. That's nothing. There are so many concepts created by tax court cases. Concepts like personal goodwill, if you haven't heard of that term before, you should write that term down and look it up. It is a monster term for us when selling a business. Personal goodwill, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it is a, ta it is a tax rule created by the tax courts only. It is not found in the code. So even when we look at the code and we look how long it is, that's just the tip of the iceberg for us. The Kennedy tax rates. This is a slide that my father did ask me to share with you all today. Look at the tax rates 50 years ago when Kennedy was in office. The highest tax rates, single, 91% for the income tax brackets. 620, over 629,000 was 87%. Look at the married brackets, the same numbers. The corporate taxes, 30 to 52%, somewhat close. Capital gains are very close, 25%. And the dividend rate, much lower, a 4% tax. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but in 1963, I was researching this, in 1963, President Kennedy proposed the first attempt at cutting taxes, at cutting these rates. And he was assassinated shortly thereafter and Lyndon Johnson takes over 
and gets the tax rates passed. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not sure Oliver Stone put that in his movie, but I'm a tax lawyer, so now I think there might have been a tax conspiracy on Kennedy's assassination when you look at those rates. Look at our new rates for 2014. And most of you are familiar with this. And I was speaking with Tom Webb this morning at breakfast, and Tom and I were talking about the 3.8% tax increase, and you'll see that there on the right-hand side. As you all know, you're all, I'm sure, very aware of it, the dividend and capital gains rates for 2014. Once your taxpayer has gone over $250,000, there's a 3.8% surtax as a result of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. There's also a 0.9% on the, on the left side of your screen. There is a 0.9% Medicaid surtax when your ordinary income drops or increases, I'm sorry, over $250,000. One of the things Tom shared with me this morning was physicians are having issues because physicians are leaving their practices and they're going into hospitals. And the hospitals, are, the hospitals did sign many of them over the last year or two as a result of the Affordable Care Act. They shut down their primary practices, merged into hospital groups. One of the things they didn't realize was how they were gonna get hit by the 3.8% tax in addition to the 0.9% tax, and now they're trying to find ways to reduce their salary contracts to get below those numbers. It is something that we see. I see it every day. I have several clients that are physicians, oncologists. It is a topic of discussion every time with them. Oh, Roman, we just signed this uh, physician's agreement, and this is what the hospital has guaranteed me for the next 20 years or five years or however long it is that I'm going to make this amount of money whether my practice makes it or not because I'm associated with this hospital. Now we're having to look at that and say, well, you know what? Dr. Smith, now you've got another tax to pay on top of that. It's a little different than what you thought it was. Let's look at some of the expired tax incentives ending, ended, ended 1231.13. Section 179, that's the biggest one. That has expired. It is back to $25,000, down from $500,000. That is very important. In an M&A transaction, when we help someone purchase a company and now they don't have the Section 179 expense that they can take in that first year or two of operation or as much of it as they could have taken, it has a big impact on their taxes going forward. I'm working with a trucking company in Florida right now uh, being bought out by one of its competitors that has 10 locations and they're buying out a two location trucking company and that had a major impact on the allocation of assets on the transaction. The fact that section 179 is no longer available. The research and R and what we call the R&D credit, but you're gonna know that as the research and experimentation tax credit, but we call it R&D but you'll also hear it as R and E. So make sure you understand when your clients are talking with you about this that you're on, the, you're on the same page. I met with a client in Florida two weeks ago, he's a defense contractor, and he comes up to me and he says, I wanna make sure I'm getting the R and D credit. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? It expired 1231.13. And he says to me, well, my competitors are taking it. I've been talking to them, they take it every year. And I said, no, it's now expired. You cannot take it any longer. It was about a $20,000 tax credit on experimentation that they would do in their companies. And then finally, IRA, well not finally, but on this slide, IRA distributions to charity. For those of you that knew what this tax incentive was, in the past you could take out up to $100,000 in your IRA and give it directly to a charity. That is now expired. Now you must take the distribution if you want to give $100,000 to a charity, now you must take the distribution, which could be subject to tax when you make the charitable donation. If it goes over your AGI, if it goes over the 7.5% limitation on AGI, it is now, could be taxable to you. So that distribution had a major impact by taking out that ability for your higher net worth clients. 
I'll be honest, I don't see that very often. Of course, in my line of work with the m and I don't see that as, as big of an issue as it, as it appears to be. State and local tax deduction, but this was a big one. You now have lost the state and local um, tax deduction that you were able to take. And the S-Corp built-in gains. For those of you that don't know what an S-Corp built-in gains is, if, you are a C, if your client or you are a C-corporation and you convert to an S-corporation, the assets must be marked up to fair market value. That markup to fair market value is a built-in gains tax to the company that is on the books of that company and liable for 10 years. Last year and in previous years, there was a credit. If you sold your assets during year six and 10 after that conversion, you did not have a capital gains tax. There was an exemption. That is now gone. That exemption expired. So again, they've made it difficult for business owners to transfer. If they made that election, if they changed from a C to an S in the last 10 years, as of 2014, now they're going to have a, a built-in gains tax. It's kind of funny because I looked at, my, I looked at our, our full write-up notes on our slides that we have at our office, and my father had pointed out to you at the last presentation that if you had made the election in the past and did not sell your assets in 2013, you were going to significantly regret it in 2014. And he made a big note in his slides and said, if you don't do what I'm telling you, your clients are going to have a major tax bill if they do sell their company in the next five years and they had made a transfer. And of course, that did, that did come to light and we're seeing it happen. One of the ones that got much higher publicity was the $250 teacher school expense. Teachers could deduct on their tax return $250 of out-of-pocket expenses that they incurred and of course that's gone. That one was a high publicity one just because of it being involving the schools and the children. So what's new for 2014? As many of you might know, we've got the estate tax, which is now up to 5.34 million. The exemption amount is 5.34. Make sure you know that too, because that has been changing and I'll, I'll talk to quite a few clients and they don't always understand that. Now, we also have portability. We've had portability, but we still have it. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later in terms of what form you fill out to get portability. But portability is important. Portability is when a husband passes away or a wife passes away and they don't use the full amount of the exemption. Whatever's remaining can be passed on to the spouse so that the spouse can use it in the future. So now we're up to 10.7 or 10.68 million that can be passed on at death. So we're starting to see a lot less estate tax problems than we used to. But portability is very important. We have to be very, very careful with portability because the states all have different estate tax exemptions. So depending upon how we craft our trusts and our wills and our insurance policies, we could create a taxing situation. I'm gonna show you another slide later where there's different state tax exemptions and if they're one million or three million or four million and we transfer the exemption to a trust, the 5.34 million, we may have created an estate tax in their particular state. So we have to be very careful with that. The Defense of Marriage Act, this was enacted in 1996. It allowed the states to refuse to recognize another state's marriage laws. It was determined unconstitutional in 2013. So that has a big impact on our tax laws. And then of course, our health care mandate. We already talked about the net investment tax of 3.8%. The final regulations were established November 26th of 2013. We already talked about the Medicare tax of 0.9%. There's also a small business health care tax credit. It is not on the slide the employer must pay one half of the premium coverage for the individual and the employer gets a tax credit for that. That is called the Small Business Healthcare Tax Credit. 
And then there were some small changes to the itemized deductions for medical expenses. Kind of make note of both of those. So section 105 and section 125. Hopefully you're familiar with section 105 plans, but if you're not, a qualified business owner can deduct 100% of the health insurance and dental insurance coverage for eligible employees and families, qualified long-term care expenses, uninsured medical, dental, and vision care expenses, life, disability, income. A Couple key things here. It's not in the law, but it is in some of the regulations. It must be in writing. You must have a written plan. Now you're not gonna see that in the law. Where that came into play was a couple of court cases came in and said that the board of directors of the companies must pass a resolution establishing the rules and regulations for that particular company. And then they must notify the employees of the plan. So there's a lot of literature out there about 105 plans, how they don't have to be in writing, but there have been subsequent court cases that have basically, by making the board of directors issue a resolution in your company to allow for a 105 plan, that has now made it to where it must be in writing. They also must be non-discriminatory. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of the discrimination elements that can apply, but you cannot have a HCI, or HCE, I'm sorry, highly compensated individual or employee that has better benefits under the plan than others. That plan would be discriminatory and disallowed. And it could also be, of course, taxed to the highly compensated individual. So they, just keep that in mind, they must have written plans and they must be non-discriminatory. Section 125 plans, cafeteria plans, written plans maintained by an employer for employees. A qualified benefit is a benefit that does not defer compensation and is excludable from an employer's gross income. Two points I wanna make out about the cafeteria plans. We're definitely more favorable from a tax standpoint on a section 105 plan than we are in a cafeteria plan. The government subsidized portion of a cafeteria plan is not tax deductible, but the unsubsidized portion is. So there's not quite as many benefits there available for your employers and we are seeing a lot more 105 plans in the small businesses that we have. So portability, how do we keep it? Form 706 must be filled out. That's the form that your clients will fill out upon the death of the first to die. If it's not filled out, there are some good faith exceptions, just like an S-Corp election, where if you miss the date, you can send in a written statement to the IRS telling them why you missed the date. The Form 706 is very similar, but for the most part, your clients need to know when their insurance plans are in place, their estate plans are in place, they need to be prepared and ready for Form 706 to be done. In fact, I include that now with my estate plans. Make sure it's part of the, part of the packet that they receive. And you can elect if you don't want to port the remainder of it. You can make that election. And then as we talked, it keeps the exemption from others alive. So let's look at the state estate taxes. California doesn't have one. As you all know, it was phased out in 2005. There's no requirement in the state of California to file an estate tax return. That requirement has been eliminated as of 05. In fact, California is so unique, in order to bring that estate tax back into California, they must have voter approval, right? So it's not likely to come back in this particular state. 
But let's take a look at those states, look at the different exemptions, and I'm gonna look at Illinois, because I'm an Illinois attorney, and I do a lot of estate plans in the state of Illinois. So Illinois is $4 million. This is what I was talking about earlier. We've got a federal exemption of 5.34, but we've got a state tax exemption of four. A typical estate plan in the past that would be drafted would be what we call a marital bypass trust or a credit shelter trust. We have a husband and we have a wife and the husband dies first. He takes the amount of the exemption and he puts it into a trust for the wife and the children. So we pass 5.34 million to the wife and the children tax free. Everything else he has above 5.34 million would go directly to the spouse tax free. You can transfer any amount you want at death to your spouse tax free. So now I've protected his entire estate. I've used his exemption and I've used his spousal exemption. But Illinois would tax that. Illinois could tax that trust money 1.34 million. And we could talk about Q-chip trusts and other, other ways to get around it. There are, ways to, there are ways to structure it to get around it. My point today is to make sure that you're aware if you're working in one of these states or you have clients in one of these states to pay close attention to the state estate tax exemption. Look at New Jersey, $675,000. And one way we've gotten around it with some estates is to, in Illinois we would say, on some of them we might say, look, we're gonna take the lesser of the exemption, whether it's federal or state, and we're gonna put that into trust for the wife and children. And then we're gonna put the remainder directly to the spouse. We're gonna use the unlimited spousal exception for the remainder. And then we've used up our exemption. We don't have a state estate tax issue. When we're looking at a business uh, or we're looking at a a business owner doing their estate plan. We might be looking at it for an M&A. We might be looking at it for a succession plan. Might be transferring it to their children. One of the things we very get commonly from the business owners is an audited financial statement. In fact, one of the um, items I will discuss in a little while is a 27 item list that our office produces. Whenever we do evaluation or whenever we do a succession plan, we have a complete 27 item list. So one of the items in that list is we want to see the audited financial statements of your company. If you're the business owner and we're doing your estate plan and we're figuring out your taxes, we want to see your audited financial statements. And we don't like them. Audited financial statements, and, and my father might have gone over this with you at your previous lecture to those that attended. They are for public companies. They are not designed for privately held companies. What do we want a privately held company to do? We do not want them to make a profit. That is not our goal as their tax attorneys, as their accountants. We want them to show a loss if they can. Sometimes there's restrictions on how many years we want them to show the loss for. But we want them to show losses. We want them to use their write-offs. Audited financial statements don't have that as their goal. We want our owners to make cash. We do not want them to show a profit. In fact, my wife and I were watching a movie on the plane last night. Uh, I would not recommend watching this movie with your children or on a plane. We were watching The Wolf of Wall Street, and it was all about cash, which was fantastic. What a great movie to watch on the way here. But I was thinking to myself, God, I really need to have a lesson in picking movies out for planes because you do not need to have that on. I was looking around the whole time making sure there were no children near us. But the key is that that's what we're looking at when we are looking at their financial statements. So we're going to recast them. One of the first things we do, and we, we have given entire lectures on just recasting the financial statements. We're going to look at depreciation. We're going to take that out. We're going to recast that. We're going to recast their salaries, if we think their salaries are too high. We're gonna recast the rent they may be paying if we think that's too high. We're gonna come up with a more truer picture for the corporation. One of the case examples that we actually did, we had a client call us in Texas, big forklift operator calls us and says, Dr. Basie and Roman, I wanna sell my company. My accountant tells me it's worth $3 million. Do, do you think I can get 3 million? I said, send us your financials. Send us your tax returns. 
We're looking at these and it's just not making sense. It's a much larger company. They were a forklift equipment rental company. So we gotta come out and take a look. Something's going on. Why is your accountant only telling you you're worth $3 million? We come out, we see they had written off all their equipment. They were still renting it. They were still using it. It was in their yards, in their warehouses. We put it back on the books. We showed the accountant how to recast the financial statement to get ready to sell the company. Believe it or not, we sold that company for, I think, $26 million by the time it was all said and done. It was a simple matter of recasting the assets and putting them back on the books. Recast the cash flow statement. I'm working with a company right now, the recasting, the, well, again, the, the trucking company in Florida. They're, we did their asset allocation last week between myself and the buyer's attorney. They're being, again, they're being bought out by a company that has about 10 um, towing and brokering truck location. They broker, um, what do you call them, freight trucks all over the U.S. So they show me their balance sheet. So I write the allocation into the legal agreement. I want to sell the assets for book value if I can. I want to sell as many assets as I possibly can at book value, if they're worth that. And again, they got to be in reason. Then I want to allocate to intangible assets, to other assets where I've only got to worry about a capital gains tax and not an ordinary income recapture tax. So we recasted the financial statements for them. And the allocation, in fact, we're still working on it today. This morning I got an email about that allocation, how the buyer's company wanted to use GAP, wanted to value the assets at GAP. Well, if we value the assets at GAP in their case, the tax ramifications are going to be so large it's not going to be possible to transact their, their deal. So recasting and showing them what else we can do, what else we can put on the books, giving them the true picture of the company, showing them what the goodwill is, showing them what the intangible value of the company is, is something that we have to do for them. One of the, thi one of the things we look at, can I go back a slide? when we recast or work on these, and I, and I kind of mentioned it, I want to know what the excess rent is in the company. One of the things I want to know is, is the real estate in the company. I want to pull that off the balance sheet. I always want that to come off the balance sheet. And for those of you that are out there and for those of you that have clients, the real estate of the operations should never be in the same company. That is a major liability to the owners, and they're losing out on a tax deduction, most likely. Those two things should always take place. It's a liability for the owners, because if a liability is created in the company, and the real estate is located in the company, it's much easier for attorneys to attach to the real estate than it is to the business assets. And of course, the real estate has value, typically has substantial value. We always want to recast and get the real estate off the books of the company. And we want to transfer it into what we recommend, which is typically a limited liability company. We want to get it into a limited liability company. And I also wanted to make the example of this is where we introduce the concept to our owners and to their advisors of personal goodwill. So we, we know we have asset value here. And we know we have excess earning values that are much higher. That's the goodwill of the company, is the excess earnings over their asset value. In some situations, we still have a selling price that is higher. They've still agreed to higher numbers. And I want to allocate to what we call personal goodwill. When I sell the personal goodwill of an owner, I am selling both owners individual asset. It's actually two closings that we transact when we do this. We're going to sell the assets of the company, or we may be selling stock, or some type of hybrid of both, and then we're going to close with the owners individually, and we're going to sell their personal goodwill. It's capital gains tax. It is allowed by the IRS. You just have to be able to substantiate it, and if you Google the terms, personal goodwill, you're going to find a lot of material on it. 
And when I say substantiate it, what's their reputation? What skills do they have? What articles have that been written about them? Have they won Chamber of Commerce awards? Are they active in their associations? Are they president of their association? Are they on their board of directors? All of that builds their personal goodwill and I can allocate more to the transaction when I'm done recasting. And the more that I can allocate, the more capital gain treatment I'm getting them when they sell their company. We really, really try to implore it as much as possible, especially when you're dealing with a C corporation. If those of you are out there dealing with privately held companies that are C corporations that are owned by, you know, a select few shareholders, you can still do it. I'm dealing with a company in um, Victor, New York that has 39 shareholders. Personal goodwill is going to be a little bit harder to allocate to all of those owners. Some of them will have it, some of them will not. And we want to adjust, I, I mentioned this to you, and that's why I wanted to go back to the slide. We want to adjust salaries. We want to make sure that the salaries on the books of the company are reasonable. We're dealing with a furniture company in New Orleans, another trip I'm very happy to make. There are some perks to my father being down at this time. You know, San Diego's a nice perk. Uh, New Orleans will be a nice perk. Family company, about six children, a mother and a father and six children, and then their grandchildren are also working in the company. One of the brothers is taking a salary from the company that's being sold and another company that the family runs. But he doesn't work in both companies. He doesn't work in the company that's being sold. He only works in the ancillary company. So we've got to examine that, take that salary, recast that salary out of that financial statement. It's an unnecessary expense. And what have we done? Raised the value of the assets, raised the value of the goodwill to the other owners. We've removed that expense from the company. So another, another little uh, tidbit that we like to do. And I know I, I had the final note there of recasting cash flow. Sometimes this is very easily done, sometimes it's not. We've got two companies in Florida, additional ones that we're working with. One's a publishing company and one is a defense contractor. When I went into the defense contractor and looked at his income state and his balance sheet, his, his last five years were like this, up and down and up and down. And another thing we want to do is remove what expenses were one time or what contracts are unordinary, and you're not going to get those. And we want to apply a smoothing factor to those so that we can get a clean picture of what the company looks like for the last three years, removing those one-time expenditures. With the publishing company, everything was so level, we didn't have to make one single adjustment to the past three years for them. Talk just briefly about some of the community property problems that you have. You've got to know when you're working with clients, whether it's estate planning, insurance, your succession planning, their business, are they in a community property state? California is a community property state. Texas is a community property state. That is a 50-50 split of the assets that are marital property. In California, that is statutory and required, but it is not a 50-50 split of the debts. The debts are split equitably. That's also in the California statutes and in most common property state statutes that the debts are not split 50-50. So you have to know what state you're working in and the basics of their law. talk briefly about some same-sex relationships. The income tax returns, they can file these for previous years. They can amend them back and file them. For tax years 2013 and going forward, they generally must file using a married filing separately or jointly filing status, and they can generally claim a refund for three years from the date the return was filed. They can go back and amend. On the cafeteria plans, if the employee purchased coverage on an after-tax basis for the employee's same-sex spouse under the employer's health plan, 
the employee can claim a refund of those income taxes paid on the premiums for the coverage. So you just kind of got to just have to know that these relationships have impacted the ability to file amended returns. Once we've dealt with the general basics of the law in the state that the employee is located in or the owner is located in, we've kind of worked through their initial estate plan problems. We, we move on to where we're either dealing with the succession or we're dealing with multiple shareholders. And then we always get to the topic of buy-sell agreements and the insurance that funds them. Any time you're dealing with a business that has, in my opinion, two unrelated parties, really meaning not married, if it's anybody else as opposed to not married, I highly recommend those companies have a buy-sell agreement. And 90% of the time or more, those are funded with key man life insurance policies or however else you may go about it. They are so protective when there are two unrelated owners. They give them a vehicle to get out of the company if they decide to. There are triggering events for them to get out of the company. They also provide a valuation methodology. Ours do. We provide the method in which we valued their company at the time they entered into the buy-sell agreement. I've had a lot of clients come to me and do them initially when they set up their companies as opposed to down the road. It can even be done initially. We still give them our methodology. We attach that to the buy-sell and we tell them if sh shareholder A wants to leave the company and shareholder B wants to buy the stock or the company's going to redeem the stock, here's the way you're gonna value the stock. That way you're not getting into arguments over value. We use four methods. The IRS says you've gotta use at least two methods when you value a company. If somebody comes in and shows you a business valuation for a company that you're gonna write an insurance policy for, you're gonna produce it for, they must use more than one method. They cannot just say, well, this is the me method of the assets. That valuation can be attacked by the IRS and reallocated. We use four methods. We look at the fair market value of the assets. We look at their earnings. We look at their cash flow. We look at their excess earnings as well. And we look at comparables. We subscribe to Pratt Stats and BizComps. If you don't know what those are, large data grouping companies that give us what industry are you selling in? This is the level of sales of companies that have sold, and this is the price they have sold for. It is just like a real estate appraisal. We can get three or four comparables and apply them to that. Now you may say, well, Roman, a lot of those companies, everybody's so unique with their company. This guy builds, one of, one of our clients builds waterproof doors for US naval destroyers. Now, how am I going to find a comparable for that company? I'm not, but I'm going to be able to find U.S. defense contractors with that level of sales and apply a multiple to that comparable. We're also going to look back when we do these at the valuations. We're going to look back three to five years. So we're going to weight the methods and we're going to weight the years that we're looking back. And we're going to weight the most recent year, the highest weight. So if we're looking at 2013, we might give that 40% of the weight of the value, and then we're gonna weight each year differently. Or if one year was more reflective of the typical part of the business, we're gonna put some excess weight onto that. We do not recommend that when you deal with business valuations of companies that the CPA for the company value the business, and here's why. The CPA for the company has signed their tax return as tax preparer and has attested to the accuracy of the return. If we go in and if, if that CPA or if we're the CPA for the client, if we go in and do a recasting of that financial statement, well, we're kind of telling the IRS what we put on the tax return isn't accurate. So we've got a conflict of interest. So we highly recommend that the CPA for the company doesn't perform the valuation. 